welcome back to the River Volta podcast. Um, today, I, you're being hosted by myself, Eliza Prodnick, and, and Ian Cannon up above. So, um, and we're joined today by, by Connor, um, Connor Kerr. So thank you for being here today. Connor is a Métis Ukrainian writer and educator living in Mos... Can we say it one more time, please? Uh, um, is Meskowatiwa Skykin is how I say it. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I had it before. I'm just getting nervous now. I'm just going with Tiwa Skyken. Mm-hmm. There you go. Hey, sorry, sorry. Mm-hmm. Hey, Connor is a Métis Ukrainian writer and educator living in, in a Muskwa Tiwa Skyken, born in Saskatoon, raised in Buffalo Pound Lake and Dryton Valley. Connor is descended from the Lake St. Anne Métis community by way of the Red River Settlement and the Pup- has Chase Cree Nation. He is a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta and has been recognized harvester for years. His Ukrainian family are settlers on Treaty 4 territory. In 2020, Connor received his Master's of Fine Arts degree from the University of British Columbia in Creative Writing. In 2012, he received his Bachelor of Art degree from the University of Alberta. He currently works in Langara College in Vancouver, BC in the Indigenous Education and Services area. Connor is, pa- Connor is passionate about crafting narratives that focus on the relationship to the landscapes around us. Comfortable with all genres, Connor's writing has been featured in the Fiddlehead, the Malahat Review, Grain, this magazine, the Yellowhead Institute, and other literary magazines. His work has been and th- anthologized in Best Canadian Stories 2020 and Best Canadian Poetry 2020. In 2019, Connor received the Fiddlehead, Fiddlehead's Ralph Gustafson Poetry Prize, and in 2021, he received the Malahat Review's Long Poem Prize. His work has been shortlisted for multiple contests. I feel like we set you up there, Eliza. You had, you had quite a few. Yeah, that's <laughs> a long. I was just thinking, I was like, I gotta turn in that bio. <laughs> I, it was fine. It's just like, an, like I was so confident going into to the pronunciation. Yeah. And then I just couldn't get it out. So Sometimes it happens when you have it in your head and you're like, I was thinking, I was like, how do you, how do you memorize pronunciation? Because it's not like you see an image in your head, right? Like you, you see the word, yeah. but you don't see how to say it in your head. Or at least yeah. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Either you just have it or you don't, and if you get off the wrong, it just yeah. you lose it. I just didn't have it this time. Yeah. Oh cool. yeah. Welcome, Connor. Where Where are you uh, yeah. coming from? Are you in Edmonton right now, or? Uh, no, I'm in Vancouver on a unceded yeah. Musqueam, Salutes, and Squamish territory here. Uh, cool. Um, I I recently moved here like um two months ago um for work. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, though I was yeah. back in uh in in Trinity on the Prairies last week for uh, a book launch at uh. Latitude, 53. latitude, right? Yeah, yeah. How'd that go? I was good. It was really good. Um, it's just my uh, good friend Emily Riddle, a great uh, Cree writer, and uh, kind of hosted it, and we had a nice little like launch, and it was good to like launch the book in a city that's like the book is written about, you know, <laughs> like yeah, not yeah, a, yeah. It's very prairie based. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I just got it. I actually just got it in the mail. Oh, right, right. on. Like, yeah, literally oh, an awesome. hour ago. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you, the story you're reading today is not from there, though, hey? No, it's not. It's a new story, um, and uh, it's coming out in the next issue of Grain. Yeah. Because uh, there was a, the second place in their last contest. It's funny because yeah. the lady who actually uh, won that contest, Kate Black, uh, legitimately, I was two minutes late because she was stopping by to grab the copy of the book that I uh, I signed for her. So I was had waiting out on the porch of my place in Vancouver here nice. to like, give Kate nice. that one, but um yeah so it's a it's called the guest lecturer uh and it's kind of about like I work in post-secondary education in um indigenous education and I've been around that for like now like 10 years basically and so it's kind of based a little bit on some of the experiences I've I've seen in post-secondary yeah it's it's interesting from uh I mean we're we're both seem to be quite passing Métis so it's interesting from that perspective you have a couple good lines in there about specifically that um, yeah, that yeah. We, that we can talk about after that are interesting. Um, I did, I did have some preemptive questions. I'm working on a, a MFA thesis as well right yeah, now. For both yeah. are, 
Yeah. Uh, we've, we've actually had like, quite a few people from um, like people who are just working uh, writers right now. And we yeah. have a few people post graduation, but we really haven't had anyone from a different graduate pro graduate program. Yeah, that's funny. I was actually gonna yeah. like, I was gonna ask how the University of Saskatchewan program was going, yeah. It's been good, it's been good. One thing we, we, uh, we have um, that I think UBC doesn't, I think Guelph is the only one that has the mentorship programs, mm, which, which I okay. think has been really good. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, I'm not sure, because I don't know much about the UBC program, but is it mostly just class-based? Mostly just class-based workshops. There's yeah. no like mm -hmm. mentorship kind of thing. Like when you're doing your thesis, obviously you have your like supervisor prof and they, uh, right. They do pair you up with like um, some of the kind of like assist with some of the stuff, like, but it's not like a true mentor. Like, it's not like, you know, you're not like actually workshopping with them. You're not like right. running workshop by or stuff. They're more like paired up with you to help you get scholarship dollars, if anything. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of I wouldn't like, mind. I wouldn't it. mind that either. No. <laughs> uh, what was your thesis? Was it the poetry question uh, you did? Avenue of Champions, actually. So oh, is this? Was, oh, really? Like, legitimately oh. was the thesis, is that book there. Um, so obviously edited uh, a little bit because it was like the collection of short stories over the course of, uh, um, I guess, my MFA. And I did the, um, it's UBC has a couple options. They have the like, uh, in like on campus program, yeah. but then they have the optional residency program. And so that's the one yeah. that I did. So it's like you do these courses, like this is obviously pre-pandemic too, like um, through yeah, like- everyone's optional residency now. And yeah, and then you get to go to campus in summer and it's a big party and it's all fun. And uh, yeah. I get to do all this different stuff. But uh, so basically like the that book, Avenue of Champions is like kind of a conglomerate collection of uh, all the short fiction that I kind of wrote during the course of that like MFA. And then I- worked with Nightwood Editions, the publishing house there to like really like make it a little bit more cohesive <laughs> and like edited it up into uh, a stronger kind of like, yeah, story all the way through rather than just like these like little isolated mm -hmm. ones. So I was going to ask you about that because I know there's no table of contents. So it's kind of like, uh, I just read uh, Jennifer Egan's, this is a goon squad. Have you heard of that? Oh yeah, I have. I haven't read it, but I heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she's got, it's, it's a variety of short stories, but they're really like a cohesive novel. And she's like, I don't really care which one it is. It could be either, you know, yeah. like it tells a straight through through line, but it's also just individual stories that are connected. Yeah, it was, it was funny actually. Cause like, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Like it's cause it's the same characters all throughout in these stories. Like I wouldn't say it's like a continual like narrative uh, the entire time. Like it's all like, Hey, here they are as kids, here they are as adults, here they are as like teenagers, like et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the uh, uh, the funny part was actually like after like because I was writing all this, but I was also submitting them to like literary magazines at the same time. And there was one like I, I submitted it to um, the Fiddlehead, actually, I think. And uh, the editor there was like, I like the story. It doesn't make sense because like I had a bunch of other because it was now written for like the novel. Um, yeah. so There's a lot of character names that like had made no sense in a short story because they were like for the novel portion. I was like, oh shit, I didn't like edit them out. Like they shouldn't be in that version of it. Like, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a one line reference to some character, you know, it's like, I think it was like references like, I wonder what Charlie would do in this in situation and no other mention of Charlie in that entire story. You know, if you're reading the whole book, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like in that one short story, it does not make sense. And so I was like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I got to let's yeah, edit this yeah. out yeah so how how you said there's some editing after mfa from the avenue champions yeah prior. How, how, how how different were they like how much editing go, went into it um it was it's funny working with like the uh uh the publishing houses comparatively to like a workshop process because i find the workshop is um as you would both know like very like here's what i like here's what i don't like maybe take some of it maybe don't like we'll see how it goes like and I, I find like you find the people within the workshop process that you like, you, you know, you work with well with, you understand them, you get, you get along well, you, uh, you do, you do those kind of things. So it's, um, uh, uh, you take like, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, hell yeah, I'll take your feedback. This is great. This is awesome. I'll get into it. But then I, um, uh, with the publishing house, like the editor there, uh, it was amazing. I really worked well with them, but they were like, like oh no no you need to do this <laughs> like there's no like wishy washiness about it they're like this makes the book better and like you can kind of be like uh i mean and as a beginning writer myself like i'm taking everyone's feedback into account because 
if these are professionals that have done this for like a long time and know kind of more of that, like I will, I'll always kind of be like, yeah, that makes sense. Like I should, yeah, I should do that. So. Yeah. yeah. What, what did you in the UBC program, did you do everything or is it a focused program? Oh, is it's it like, like one of those ones where you like, so you, you kind of can focus in, but you have to take courses in two, three different genres. So um, so it ends up kind of interesting because you see people like you'll be in a poetry course or a fiction course. And I'll be like, I remember just being in there and being like, that person's writing is absolute garbage. Like, wow. Like, how are they in this MFA program? And then you like yeah. chat a little bit more with them. They're like, oh, they're actually like a screenwriter. They're into like children's writing, you know? Yeah, and you're like, yeah. like, this is like, they're taking this poetry course because of the requirements. This isn't like, they're like whole thing. You're like, ah, that makes sense. You know, or uh, poetry specifically is a little bit more around that because you know people can like really um uh like fiction you can kind of transfer a lot of those skill sets over but i feel poetry is such a weird like yeah genre that the people who do it well like are it's tough yeah eliza did you do poetry like regularly at all before we had a poetry class no it was it was i had like just you know dabbled in it just but not nothing serious so it it was kind of new to me i think for quite a few people in our in our cohort it was quite new it's funny because I did a poetry collection, but I took the poetry class and I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I don't oh, know yeah. anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It oh. was like learning a new language for sure, like a, just a whole new skill set of, of, for writing. I had a whole hissy fit in one workshop because of, um, um, and I got really like, well, it was just because of like punctuation, like all these like, like uh, and actually uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a lady named Aaron Steele kind of explained it all to me in like better terms later, but I was like, I don't get it. I don't know why I have to put a comma here or a period there. Like it makes no <laughs> sense to me, like in a poem, like it doesn't, I'm like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just like, and then, uh, <laughs> and then I had a, a friend who kind of like afterwards was like, well, no, you should probably do it like this or yeah. So yeah. There's, I guess there's like, there's, there's like kind of thing where it's like, you can break rules, but you got to know why the rules are there in the first place. Like, you don't, yeah. have, to put a, yeah, you, yeah, you don't yeah. have to put a punctuation, but you should know why you would. Yeah. And I, I don't know any of the rules. So it's all like, good to, <laughs> like what is a verb again? Yeah. 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 It's funny. Yeah. Cause it's, I think poetry for me was always one of those things that was just instinctual. Like, I would just do it. Yeah. When I like something would come or like an image would be in my mind and I would just do it, but I was never like studying or reading a lot or like really working towards that voice like I was with fiction yeah but yeah. when you actually like take a class and you're like there's rules and stuff and you're like oh my god i don't i don't know anything about anything yeah <laughs> deep end well i think that's i think that speaks to a lot of people who start with poetry i think it's very like cathartic for a lot of people yeah. it's a good way to like express emotion but like yeah when you are all of a sudden exposed to like the rules and different forms and everything that comes with poetry it can be like there's a lot that goes into it that is scary <laughs> Oh, there's so much. It's yeah, yeah it's like I, I wrote off like um like or started off when I was like a kid, well, like a teenager, you know, writing just like the worst poetry. Like I like oh yeah. Uh, when I was moving to Vancouver, I um uh like went through all these old boxes that my like uh, my grandmother had dropped off in my place when before she moved out and uh um and so it's all like my like childhood writing, you know, like high school writing and stuff that she had saved. And I was just like going through and I'm like why did I write out the tea list at like this coffee shop? Like what, how is that a poem? You know, or there was just like these like emo ones that are basically just like channeling like old, like My Chemical Romance or Alexis on Fire, like songs. And they're just like repeating those words, like exactly, except for like changing like two like lines in it. And I'm just like, That's oh great. God. Like I was, I was having yeah, one of my friends, uh, Jessica Johns, like free writer there. And, and she's just like, was there anything good? Was there anything worth saving? I'm like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> like, yeah, it was like, yeah. At the time though, I feel like you're like, oh, I'm killing it right now. Like, totally, this is, yeah. This is amazing. Even uh, you have to have that kind of like beginning ignorance, I think, to keep going, right? Oh, 100%. Like, to keep doing yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, even like um, uh, in, in that there too, there was a lot of stuff from my like undergrad days because I took a lot of creative writing courses at University of Alberta. And, and I remember like writing these stories and being like, this is the greatest story ever written like you know it's just this is amazing everyone should be so into this like love it like and I would like submit them to all these like literary journals at the time um and of course none of them like got back because they're not good stories like I like reread them and I was like oh god like these are not good like and at the time I was like so blown away that no one would publish them and now I'm like I 
know why no one would publish them. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It was that, uh, it was like a psychological phenomenon, the Dunning Kruger, where it's like, if you don't know enough to know it's terrible, you think yeah. you, you about, you're like, you can't evaluate when you're very new, you can't evaluate what's good yet. And yeah. so you overestimate yeah. your ability. And then once you get to like a middle ground, you think everything sucks before you get to like a mastery level. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know enough to know it sucks, but you don't know enough to know how to make it better. Yeah. I feel I'm very much in that. Uh, like everything sucks now. <laughs> I like write something. I'm like, this is trash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, where like, yeah, like 10 years ago, I was like, this is the greatest thing anyone's ever written. And now I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> this is so like bad. I guess we'll see if it works. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I get both stages. I get the right, like kind of like right after glow. You know, I've just finished it or like, yeah, I yeah. just edited it and it's like pretty good. I'm like pretty happy. And then a month later I read it again. I'm like, Oh my God, what, what am I writing? I'm yeah. the same way, Ian. Definitely. It's like at first you're like, yeah, okay, I could work with this. And then you read you, it then, later. Then Eliza, then you must be in the stage right now that I am in at where you're re reading all the stuff we did for a mentorship and you're like, oh, oh what yeah. happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have read a little bit of it and I have decided I'm not going to go down that road until I'm just going to keep writing until I'm, I'm at the end of that book before I go back. Yeah. That's a, that's a funny thing too about like the book itself because it, it takes so long for like the publishing yeah. process. Like, so like the poetry book I just released, like an explosion of feathers, like most of those poems I wrote like on it, like years ago, it feels like now. And I'm so over them at this point. And um, mm. even having you a champions because like that whole thing was written like legitimately like two, two, three years ago at this point or the vast majority of it. And so I'm like, but it's coming out, you know, it's out and you're supposed to be like reading from it and like doing all this stuff. I'm like, no, 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 I don't like this anymore. Like I want to like mm -hmm. read my new stuff, which hence why I'm, I, I asked if I could do that for this podcast. Cause I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm way more into this now. Like I, I know these books are out and I'm supposed to be like promoing them, but mm -hmm. I'd way rather just what, like, yeah. Whenever I give someone my first book, I say the first novel, I say, here you go, but just don't read it. Yeah. Just don't yeah. read it. You know, you can have it in your shelf. Just don't, you don't have to read it though. <laughs> totally yeah I feel like that with the poet everyone's like oh I'll buy your poetry book I'm like you don't need to like yeah it's fine <laughs> yeah. like don't don't worry about it like yeah I like it for the on the shelf people's shelf yeah like advertise me but oh, you don't have to read it yeah yeah, Part yeah. Was, Connor is there anything you want to say before you jump into uh into your reading no I think I'm I think I'm all good yeah okay well we're, we're gonna just mute ourselves stop the video and then you can begin whenever sure sounds good All right, so I'm going to read a story called The Guest Lecture, and uh, as I mentioned to Eliza and uh, Ian earlier, this is a uh, one that I, uh, I wrote around uh, a lot of the experiences I have working in post-secondary institutions, specifically in Indigenous education here. So, um, and this recently uh, won second place in Grain's short fiction contest, and um, will be out in their next issue in the winter here. Whenever I get lonely, I go and sit under the sludge waterfall, a big rusted up culvert sticking out of the riverbank, dumping the wastewater of the city into the river. I don't remember a time before the sludge waterfall, but my grandparents assure me that the creek used to flow free, crisp, clear, and that the creek led out naturally into the river down by where they got this big tourist boat parked now. This is the only place that I can hear my grandparents' voices anymore. It used to be that I could just sit under any tree or any beat up old picnic table and their songs would surround me. Now their voices only echo from within the culvert and I have to listen hard to hear them. They're always just faint. And if it rains and the creek rises, then the city washes out their words. I don't tell the man from the university about that. He likes to ask me all sorts of questions, wants to hear all the stories that my grandparents told their friends over crab apple bounce and rollies while I sat under the card table and played with my Lego pirate ship. I never knew that knowledge would have such a price tag put on it. The stories have become the new furs, the bison, the birds, and the man, well, he pays me pretty well each time I meet up with him. He made me sign a bunch of forms around ethics or use of story or some shit like that. I didn't really care because it's cash and who else do I have to talk to? I'm assuming he's taking these stories and writing them down somewhere, secretly recording me because he never carries a notebook or laptop. I probably signed the rights away with those papers. Fuck it. It felt good to hear the words again. And I tried my best to pull the little laughs, pauses and angers into proper moments, just like my granny would. And I played the part of my grand across from her, 
silent with an ace up his sleeve, ready to bust it out when the time came and scoop up the quarter pot. I'm playing my own card game now with the professor. He told me that he was Métis, but didn't really have anything to back that up except for a little card and the proof of family lines that weren't erased by social workers in schools. When I drive the forklift back at the warehouse during the days, I try and remember some good stories for him. They used to come easy, but lately they started slipping. Could be the weed. If the guy writes the book, I'd insist on the title, Lifestyles of the Papa's Chase Descendants. A good band name if I was 21 again, and that shit still impressed the beautiful woman who backboned the music scene. I can never play the guitar, but I can swing this forklift on a dime. Any truck that comes into the yard, they want me loading up the pallets full of valves. Hey, chief, get on over here, they yell from their cabs, and I mimic shooting them with a bow and arrow. It's those little jokes that give me something to look forward to during the days. Funny part is, it's all native guys in the warehouse, and there are a couple Cree girls from Saskatchewan that work the front desk. But when the truck drivers yell something like that, it's only me that responds. Terry, the big guy from up north, one of those size 32 by 32 jeans with an XXL hoodie, gets right pissed off when I do that. Don't fucking give him that shit. They already think we're a joke, he said to me one time. If he sees me doing something like that, he shakes his head and then makes jabs at me when we're having our smokes. You want us to be fucking stereotypes? Give your head a shake. I don't give a shit about stereotypes. I need money. That's survival now. And if I can laugh a bit during the day, then fuck you, Terry. I'll do what I want. Terry thinks he's smarter than the rest of us because he has an undergraduate degree. Got in native studies over at the same university Prof Bud works at. He likes to bullshit and tell us about how he's going to be a lawyer one day. He's just saving up enough to go to law school and the band won't pay for grad programs. It's been about five years of saving at this point and I don't think he's any closer, but he fancies himself moving up into sales or management. That's where the Munya hang out. They sell the valves we pack and load up, bullshit in their offices, and try to avoid coming back to what they call the res, the warehouse. We have to put our safety stickers on our hard hats. Some of the guys like to load theirs up with other stickers too. The young guys always like to put on the Crown Royal or Jack Daniels labels from their bottles to show us that they can drink. That fades after they switch over from the green to the black or blue hard hat. I pulled the same shit when I was 17 and started up here. I told Terry one time that he should get his degree shrunk down and print it out as a sticker and put that on his hard hat. Same shit as framing it and putting up in an office. He didn't like that at all. I can't even imagine what he would say if I knew that I met up with Professor Mann from the university. Me, I know my place. I'm a forklift king and will be until the day they throw my body in the river and let it float down to Montreal. I told the professor that's how I want to be buried. He didn't think that was proper. But he's a fancy fuck. Always shows up to our coffees or beers wearing a plaid shirt, but not like my plaid shirt. You can tell his come from some boutique. Mine out are straight out of Markswork Warehouse, too, for $20 sales. It's hard to find sizes there that are small enough for me, and I'm not a small guy either. A lot of big boys out there. When I graduated high school, Granny had her friend making up this beautiful ribbon shirt. It's a deep blue with white ribbons and Métis infinity symbols in the breast pockets. Only problem is the thing is an XXXL. Legit fits like a dress on me. Maybe if I ever have a girlfriend, I can put it on and do some sexy dances around the house in it. Professor Boy asked me to go to his class the last time we chatted and tell some stories to his students. He wanted me to wear something nice, but I don't think I can wear that shirt. Got to start pounding mushroom burgers and milkshakes from the Burger Baron if I want to make it fit. I'm pretty nervous about going to the university to speak. He told me it would be all good, though. There are only about 30 students in the class, and they're very curious to hear stories about the Papa's Chase peoples. But I'm losing them. I don't know what's happening, but over the last few months, I don't have the stories flowing through my head like they used to. I'm trying to walk those same routes through the ravine that my grandparents did before me and their parents before them and their parents before them and their parents before them, and on and on and on and on until we get back to before anyone had ever heard of a European or the Missy or Missy Kwan that came with them. Big bad prof is insistent that I bring something new, something edgy, something that will impress his colleagues and students from a real life source. I'm not an idiot. I know he's getting his academic cred or whatever they call it from me. Makes him seem like he's part of a bigger community or something. Makes him seem legit. But I've told him all the stories I used to know and even those seem to flow right by me now. I can't grasp the words. When I walk along the trails, I try to speak him out again. Granny's granny was born under the bridge. Shit. What bridge was it again? The river bridge? 
the creek bridge, train bridge. It's important though. That's where her umbilical cord is buried, where her blood is rooted into the land. Sometimes I wonder if it was even here, if it was just a dream. And my family is actually from somewhere far off in Saskatchewan or BC. Did I imagine all this? I try and picture the faces of my grandparents, the wrinkles and crow's feet, the gray curls and scraggly beards stained yellow from smokes, the way they moved after a lifetime of getting knocked down over and over again. I wish I had some photos or something. I'm an idiot. Of course, they're from here. I've never known anything else but the city and the land that should have been the reserve and then wasn't. And then the land that was the reserve and then wasn't. The night before the so-called guest lecture and I'm sitting in my bathtub at home, sweating bullets into the scalding water. I'm trying to think of a good story to tell, one that will get me paid enough to cover taking the day off of work and a bit extra. I'm hoping that the bath water will substitute for the sludge waterfall. It all ends up in the same place. Do voices fade as time goes on or is that just in my own head? Am I pissing off the ancestors by giving their stories away? No, no, no. If I don't, then everything will decompose back into the land. At least the university will hold them for us. Someone will hear them and think of the Papa's chase. What well, we could have been. The tub drains away and I flip around like a bald seal, stick my head underwater and put my ear as close to the fling water as I can. Nothing. I tell off and call Terry up. He's the only person I know has ever dealt with the university and still goes to ceremony. What's well, you good? He asks, hey man, I got a problem. I tell him about the university, man, the stories, the voices, the talk tomorrow, all of it. Terry listens, he doesn't interrupt, not even the cough or clear his throat. The only sound I hear is when he drags on his smoke. I finish telling him and I realize that the thing I want the most isn't to share some story for cash, but just to be able to hear my grandparents' voices again, crisp, clear. You an idiot, he asks, huh? Buddy, they're giving you a fucking sign. It couldn't be more clear. There's no hidden agenda here. Spirits sometimes have one, sure, but not in this case. It's straight up. Just stop. You think it's a coincidence? Give your head a shake. What should I do? You have to figure that out. But just remember, you don't owe them anything. They'll take and take and take and take and take. Throw you a couple bucks and call it re reconciliation. Guy says he's made tea, though. Everyone's fucking made tea when it's convenient and white when it's not. Do you think if I stop, the voices will come back? The call ends. I stare at the iPhone and I think about throwing it off my third floor apartment balcony down to the street and watching it smash against the concrete. I imagine that the cell phone is a bomb and it'll blow all this shit up and unearth the old bones. And it'll blow that stupid culvert sky high where it'll flip over and over and over and over again until it comes crashing down on top of the legislature and smashes the marble pillars into the earth. Then the creek will unfree again. I find my way through the labyrinths of different buildings on campus. The professor in his text said that the first numbers stand for the floor and the second is the room number. That doesn't tell me where the humanities center is. All the students I dodge around seem so young. They stare at me. I know that I stick out. It's easy to see who doesn't belong. I gave myself some extra time to find the room. Good thing. When I get there, I think I'm in the wrong class. It's packed full of people, hundreds of them. And I step out and keep going down the hall. Then a hand on my shoulder and the prof is there smiling, sweating, balding, wearing a moose hide vest with intricate flower designs on it. Before I could say anything, he has me on the stage at the front of the classroom. There are hundreds of eyes staring at me from the seats. I can feel them waiting on the edge of them like coyote pups to devour what has been brought home for them. I can handle a couple of coyotes, but a whole pack will be hard to deal with. The prof brings me a bottle of water. I can't open the top. The bottle keeps squishing in as I try with my sweaty hands to get a good grip on it. I give up and set it down. All the eyes are watching, hungry. There's an introduction where the prof says in a voice without nervousness who my ancestors are. Then he talks about who he is. I try and think of a story, anything. It's all blank. The only thing that comes to my head is Terry telling me to smarten the fuck up. Crisp, clear. I approach the microphone and it hisses its displeasure through the hall in a piercing shriek. I get closer and it fades away. So who wants to know about forklifts? I ask the crowd. I sit by the sludge waterfall, but there are no more voices or songs from my grandparents. There hasn't been for a long time now. There hasn't been any more money coming from the prof either, but that's okay. It's better this way. 
I like to think that the old stories went back to the land, that they lived in the waters of the creek that will one day flow into the river again, crisp, clear. Done. All right. Elijah, do you have any uh, immediate reactions? I really, I, one thing I noticed while you're reading is that I really appreciated, I don't know, I mean, you wrote it, but I appreciate the way you <laughs> read it. It was, I, I know I find that a lot of times when people sit down with their own work or are just reading a story, they put on this, like, like the, I'm the author reading voice. I don't oh, know if yeah, you know yeah. I'm talking about, but I don't know, like the way you just read it, it made it feel inviting. It, it was like, it made it feel like just this everyday like accessible language and story that I think was really surprising to me that I really enjoyed so thank you that, that was my uh yeah, author voice <laughs> oh well I liked it I liked it because it felt natural like it didn't feel like like for yeah. I don't know do you know what I'm saying I, I do I uh, I have a I have a friend who well she just finished Avenue of Champions and she says to me she's like I I liked it but I didn't like it because I just like, it was just your voice in my head the entire for 200 plus pages. She's like, I, I didn't need that. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, she, was just, she was just joking. She was like, yeah, but uh, it was kind of funny. She's like, I could really hear you do that. But I think that's like, that's the cool thing about voice is like, and that's mm -hmm. when you know you got like a unique one. It's like where it's very like, you know, it reads like that conversation. It reads like an yeah. story in, yeah. Yeah, I think it was Austin Elijah who said, uh, it's, only, it's the first time I heard this compliment, but she was like, uh, it sounded like something you would write. And it felt like a compliment. You know what I mean? Like you've developed yeah. a voice. Yeah, and she was saying in a workshop to me and I was like, oh, that's a really nice thing to say, but I've never thought of that as a thing. Like it sounds like you. Yeah. yeah well, I guess, yeah, it, it's where you've hit your stride where it's like you have created something unique that only you, you can do. And I think, yeah, no, it is a compliment. Yeah. It is something I think that's important that we all kind of, work towards i think yeah well, it's it's super important because that's like where like the actual like good story like comes from like i don't i don't yeah. i really like miriam taves writing um i have no idea what her actual voice sounds like but you know i feel like from her writing like i i know what a voice is for that or like colson whitehead like i just finished reading harlem shuffle recently and like that's such a good voice like the voice is just so like like you can't put it down because you're just like in there and it's so apparent and so unique and so distinct. And I think that's like where beginner writers often err is they try to like, and like, this is just learning the craft and like learning yeah. the work um, is you try to like air or like you copy like the writers you like, you know, you copy the writers, you know, you kind of write like in their style, even if you don't know you're doing it, you are doing it. And mm -hmm. um, it's all learning. It's all good, but it's kind of, once you like can, reach past that and get kind of your own like voice really like instinctually in there um yeah and I tell students sometimes when I do these kind of talks or whatever and I'm like hey like you should uh like write a story out the way you would like tell a friend over like a pint of beer or like a or like a coffee you know and then like later on you can go back and edit it but like it should almost sound like you're like legitimately just bullshitting with someone like yeah there's a uh, George Saunders uh, has a really good quote. He was, I think, his recent book, uh, "Swim in a Pond and Rain." He was saying how he, when his first book, he was putting it out, he was sending it to publishers, and one publisher came back to him and was like, "This is good, but it seems like there's something missing." And then he he said like, what he realized at that time was what was missing was himself. Like it, he was just copying Hemingway, basically. Yeah, totally. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. He was just missing his own his own voice. Uh, was this the first time you read it out, or have you read it aloud before? No, that was the first time I've read out loud that story. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Did you notice things? Like, because I know whenever I read something yeah. out loud, I go, ah. Oh, I tend to like, um, like I tend to like kind of move some words around, you know, <laughs> like I'm like, yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. I, I, there was one uh, couple lines there. It's funny you mentioned that actually, because like I skipped a lot of thems and like, if I was going to go back, I'd like yeah. edit them out. because it was like, I hear them. I see, like, hmm. you know, it's just like them, sure. them, 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 them. And I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah, like yeah. It sounds like. You know, I don't, I don't think. Connor, I don't think I've ever heard uh, out loud reading that they didn't uh, edit something while reading. Yeah, I just would say that, Ian, I, we've like in almost every single podcast that we've like, that I've been host on, I've definitely yeah. noticed that as well, which is always interesting. Oh yeah. You it's also that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Connor. Oh no, I was just going to say, you always find those funny, like little, like, yeah. Uh, nuances there or like, Hey, I yeah. should have like another, you know, even like, I'm like, Ooh, I could add a couple more, like, 
this one's very much a word count story. I was like, the contest was like, whatever, 2,500 words. Uh, um, and so I'm like, I need to nail that. But, you know, going back and editing it later, I'm like, oh, I need more, a little bit more detail there, you know, or like, oh, I need a little bit more yeah, yeah. there. What reminds me of the, it's the short story or writing like, is like a painting. It's just never done. You just eventually just stop working on it. Totally. And I heard some profs like talk about that at, uh, when I was at UBC, how, <laughs> Cause I, I was kind of asking this question myself. I was like, so when do you like stop editing? Uh, I was talking about poetry specifically, but I'm like, your poems. And this is a uh, Susan Musgrave and, and Susan Musgrave's like, I don't, she's like, I've had them come out in books and I'll like see them come out in a book and I'll still edit it just for my own like notes. Like, even though I like have, and then she's like, and then eventually at some point you just like never read that book again, but that's like where it kind of like ends. Yeah. It's not a, like she's like every time I reread or relook at it, like I always find something that I need to like alter, even if it's just a little bit, you know. But yeah, especially because like you change as you go on too. Totally, like your what yeah. your tastes and everything are. Oh yeah, when I was like twenty, I wanted to be Hemingway too. As like you know, like I actually uh, moving out here, I kind of cleared out my bookshelf because I was going through and I was like, oh, there's all this like white patriarchal shitty like hetero like writing that is just so like it's exactly like every like 20 year old English liter lit, lit majors like bookshelf you know it's like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Hemingway, um, like Chuck Klosterman like all these like uh, uh, there's no diversity on it whatsoever like it's all just like and I, I, I like to think my writing and reading has got a lot better like since those days um, and but I was just like going through I'm like I don't need like a copy of like William Fall like all, as I lay dying like if I ever want this book again, I'll go to any used bookstore and pick it up for like 50 cents or a buck. Like, yeah, I don't need this copy anymore. Or better yet, go to the library, then you can. Uh... Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, have you ever been to the, is it 25 cent books at the, at the city library in Edmonton? No, I don't think I have. Yeah. They do it, they do it four times a year where you just, you can just find an insane amount of books. It's all 25 cents, everything that they're giving. Oh, okay. They're selling. Yeah, so I'd usually just walk away with like a box, a big, yeah. huge bin. Because you're gonna find you're like like the, it speaks to the the Faulkner stuff. Those will always be there. You already have them. You have them, but you you just find like all those classics for twenty five cents because they probably just need to get rid of them eventually. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, twenty five hundred word thing was interesting because I've just been doing the CBC Prize. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's twenty five hundred words, and it's an interesting experiment to like I could take four thousand word stuff or like five thousand word stuff. I submitted two almost 5,000, almost 4,000, and just like, what does not need to be here? Totally. You're absolutely right. It is an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you realize how much, how many words you use to say nothing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, one, one second. I just got to run. There's a, someone just dropped something off the place here. Yeah, no worries. Oh, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm doing no the, worries. Uh, everyone's stopping by, I like to pick up the copies of the book. And yeah, yeah. I, uh, of course, everyone's coming by right now, so. Oh, no it's, fun, it's, a fun, it's a fun process uh we'll just jump back in i'll just re I'll jump it up to here but uh just out of curiosity what do you what do you sign in your books what's your what's your go-to phrase oh it was funny we were talking i was talking about this recently at the book launch last week in edmonton there um so I, uh uh my friend jessica johns this career writer comes out and she's like don't give me your bullshit like the like you know the like the stock like thing like i and, and mine's all the love like I was yeah, right, all, all the love, love like uh, uh, yeah. Connor or whatever, but because, and she's like, I want something personalized. I don't want all the love. Like, you know, I want something like yeah. actually meaningful. And I thought that was so funny that she, uh, she was ready. Like she was on that, you know, from the get go. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever consider doing like a, a secondary purchase where it's like you get a signature plus book and it's a slightly more money? Ooh, no. Yeah. No? <laughs> I still like, I mean, um, I'm still I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, I've absolutely seen it. Uh, I have a buddy. Yeah. Uh, you actually probably know them, Ian. Uh, Joe Gerba. Um, the Joe. No, I don't know. He was no, like a, he was like an Edmonton rapper in like the early like mid two thousands. Like a uh, mm. funny guy, it's super nice guy. But he just like self published yeah. released the book, and um, and he was doing the whole like Kickstarter fundraiser like yeah uh, get thing. And I, I love supporting people's work, so I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll get that, but I, uh, I'm still, my son, I'm just still blown away that people want to read any, or like listen to anything I've ever written. So like, I will yeah. find my life away when it comes to that. Like <laughs> I, uh, I recently got an agent, uh, and they're, 
it's very good that they're there because like I would just be like hey you want to read this book awesome like here you go and uh, uh my agent uh Cody Catano is uh their name and Cody's just like no 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 <laughs> like yeah this is not a, like yeah uh do not just sign everything that comes across your like step why what's the what's the idea there oh because he wants to you know he wants to actually get like a good publishing deal and like get some good like right. uh money or get it like out in the world and like actually get oh that I, thought, I thought you stuff. meant he meant literally like signing books and stuff don't sign oh it. no 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 i'm not where i'm like yeah i got you i got you anything and i'll sign any book like it's like yeah, have you yeah, yeah, yeah. Book? I'll like sign if people it. put a contract in front of you you're just like okay <laughs> oh totally yeah yeah <laughs> well, let's just, so, let's jump back into the the reading here unless you yeah. had a question eliza no I, I was actually just gonna segue back into nice. the reading I, I wanted to know um a little bit more about about the story about maybe your inspiration or where this particular story comes from yeah uh this one um so i find like working especially especially working in post-secondary and also being a writer and then an indigenous writer like i see it from both sides kind of where there's this like interesting um thing happening in the last like 10 kind of years in post-secondaries where and it might have even happened before that but just in my own experience where uh indigenous knowledges are like they're not um it's like a very much a cultural voyeurism or like indigenous experiences where like the university wants to talk about it or showcase it but they don't want to necessarily like work on systemic change or anything along those lines so they love bringing in someone to like further up uh profs like you know uh credibility or something along those lines and this one in particular i thought was very interesting because uh or i like this one because it kind of speaks a lot to even current movements around like um people who've kind of almost like faked their indigeneity to be able to like get jobs to get like um writing to get pro like all these whatever you get from that kind of shit um and doing it and it's super well it's i'm not gonna get all the reasons why it's bad um but they almost like bring in people to like validate themselves while doing mm -hmm. that so they're like hey like i can like pay this person to bring them in to try to like validate but then there's like this financial component behind it too and it's just like a um so I was trying to capture a little bit of that. And also like I worked in like hot shotting oil field parts around in warehouses for years. So I thought that was kind of funny to include in the story as well. But what what warehouse did you work in Edmonton? Ooh, um, well, I worked uh, for like an oil field company. Um, uh, and I basically just drove to a million warehouses picking up parts all along the way. But yeah, um, I worked in the uh, superstore in Safeway. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Warehouses, yeah. yeah. Picking, picking the pallets. Yeah. And Pallet. it's oh yeah oh yeah this is the worst jobs um but yeah this one was funny too because like you'll probably um edmonton people would recognize like um when you're driving across the bridges to the south side there's a big metal culvert that sticks out of the riverbank that used to be where the mill creek ravine ran into um and so i kind of wanted to like find something with that too yeah yeah what's your what's your film of that i'm uh, as I was saying before, I'm white passing Métis, but very rarely, I, I almost feel, like you said, uncomfortable sometimes to bring it up or to use it because I don't want to feel like I'm doing exactly what you're talking about that, like where it's convenient to be Métis and it's convenient to be white when it's convenient, right? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting thing for like, as I'm also a white passing Métis person in, um, uh, because it's so much connected back to like community. Uh, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, one second. I'm, I'm going to re-answer this one. Hey, sorry about that. Um, oh, no worries. Worry. Do you mind re-asking that, Ian? I think that's very important. Yeah, I was just saying, as, as a, a white passing Métis and a white passing author, uh, sometimes, you know, you're, you're tempted to use it or to, like, put it forward as, like, part of your identity. Um, yeah. And so I sometimes feel, even though it is my part of my identity, I feel uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes, I, like, I do talk about it, but sometimes I just feel uncomfortable. And I, I wonder if you, because there's some of this in the story, like that, speaking to that. And I wonder if you want to talk about that. Yeah, um, when I think in this story, because it's such a funny, because uh, uh, like I always think of my cousins who are like, they don't, like I'm very invested in like Métis politics, Métis governance, like the uh, indigenous community. And my cousins are very much like they live in the, sorry, in the indigenous community. But they don't give a shit about all this other stuff. You know, they're just going about their like, day-to-day -day life like they just like work mm -hmm. you know they're just like hey i'm a metis person i just do this like i 
I don't, they don't think twice about like what it means to be like all of this. They're just like, do, 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 do. this is just what I do. Like, it's not my, not my kind of prerogative where I find that because of like the lack of um, indigenous voices in Canlet for so long and perspectives that is so important for like Métis people is like to be holding ourselves like accountable to community, you know? Um, to be always like able to like answer back to community about like who you are, where you're from, who your family can kinship connections are, how to um, <clears throat> also sorry, um, and how to uh, like give back in a way, you know, and whatever means that is if it's fiscal great, if it's volunteering great, like, you know, there's always so many ways to like, make sure we're constantly giving back to community. And one of the um, things that I feel like Métis people are always like thinking about that and how we do give back the community in doing so. But as also like white passing Métis people, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're elevating and lifting up the voices of like um, Métis people, Indigenous people, Black people, other peoples of color that might not necessarily have that same like advantage or option, you know? So, and that's like something that we also need to like really hold ourselves accountable to. Yeah, I like that. Uh, it is it is interesting because it is also like I'm having a bit of a turn of also like why well, should be owning that title a little bit more <clears throat> out there. Yeah. Why why am I like letting it go? Because um, there aren't not a lot of voices, and so wh why not like yeah. you know, use that voice? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, but it is still a battle because you're like, why well, I, have I had that lived experience though? Yeah, people don't treat me that way because they don't know. Yeah. They do ask, what are you all the time, though? I do, I do get that a lot. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where are you? Where are you from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah such in Saskatoon. Um, I mean, that's like Métis, like, capital there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's COVID, so I don't, I don't, I don't uh, meet a lot of people, you know, on, uh, yeah. out in the streets. Um, I, there was a scandal, wasn't there, at the UBC? Sorry? Uh, a literary or English professor? Wasn't there a scandal at the UBC? There was a professor? Oh, that was... Who Oh, okay. Or wait, no, no, no. Yeah, there's, I mean, honestly, this is like the thing is like now um, indigenous communities are like very, and good and rightfully so, are very much more comfortable with like calling out people who have been like kind of being pretendians, like faking their indigeneity. Mm -hmm. um, and like, it always comes back to that whole like, uh, um, like, yeah, who are you and who are you accountable to, you know? And so like, I always say like, hey, here's my exact like, my family is like the Gladue Quinn Ginters from the Oxenand, from the Papa State Screen Nation, like who ended up in the road allowances north of St. Paul de Metis afterwards. And my other side of the family is from like Treaty 4 territory, and like uh, she hosts Saskatchewan, you know? And, and, I, uh, <clears throat> and I feel by just being like open and transparent and like saying like, here are like, here's my family, here's my community, here's exactly who I am, here's who I'm accountable to. Like, it holds you in place as an indigenous person too. And it holds like, makes you put like those kind of like check marks around it where when I hear like someone will go to me and I'm like, they're like, oh, I'm AT. And I'm like, oh yeah. So like, where are you from? Like, what's your family from? And they're like, well, and that's like kind of where it ends, you know? And I'm like, well, I understand that there's a lot of factors that have gone into like people reclaiming indigeneity. Like, um, you know, like it's very much that these records and these histories and these cultures have been wiped out by like governmental, like, genocidal actions over the years but if you're going to be like uh claiming indigeneity or like then you need to do that research to know those kind of things you know you need to like yeah like look into it yeah yeah i like what you said about the community of just like just figuring it out then like if you're gonna take the the name yeah and, like yeah, use yeah. it part of your identity well then figure out your identity then yeah yeah be part of it what's uh I had a good question. There was a, a, a line in there that I that I really really liked. Um, oh, that that the Terry one and putting a sticker on the uh, on his hard hat. Oh yeah yeah yeah. So that was like and I, and it, that, yeah. <laughs> so when I was I worked, wondering if that. Um, oh, so uh, oh I, 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 that one is like I worked in when when I was driving a hotshot truck around because um, I had degree in English literature and creative writing you know so like and uh and a lot of the guys I worked with would always like make fun of me and bug me 
because we'd be on like rig sites or something and you'd always have to have all your state safety stickers like on your hard hats everyone just put them up there and uh, my one friend's like because everyone always made fun of me for having a university degree and they'd be like hey man why don't you shrink that degree down and put it up on your hard hat like the only place it's useful for and yeah yeah i always thought that was, yeah, was funny or a funny image i was going to ask if you're like internalizing the char character terry yourself a little bit yeah. I, I i always find there's like a, a composite you know between them I'd, I'd probably lean more into the other character um the unnamed kind of like narrator main one mm -hmm. but i find it's like everyone's like a composite you know it's always like when people are like oh is this based off someone like particular i'm like no it's not actually like it's like it's based off an idea or like an idea of like some line or some image you know um and the character gets created around that it's not necessarily like so sure they might have like a few lines that could be like very attributed to like someone but it's not actually like them in any sense of the word so but that's a beauty of fiction. yeah i you can do that yeah yeah that's what i do i just pull and i <clears throat> take people together things i like about people are places or like or if i'm like i need an apartment i'll just think of an apartment and just mold it a little bit totally yeah uh and then eliza did you have anything else to ask before we jump to the rapid fire no i no thank you for for sharing the story and for yeah, the discussion it was great yeah for sure yeah i actually i just thought of it so i just did this project with a friend of mine uh have you ever met kyler he's from edmonton kyler zeleny he has a Mundare yeah, sausage so. yeah and uh he, we just did this thing where we went on to little bars and we're, he wants to do like these stories that are disappearing and so like go to interview people and talk to all these people in little bars and little towns oh yeah 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 that's cool yeah yeah and he, he wanted to do 100 bars uh over like a summer so we just did it yeah. yesterday but it reminded me, this story reminded me of that concept of like, how do you protect your stories that are disappearing and how do you continue to keep them there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I think that's such a like a loss, like uh, art, you know, and even like thinking back to like, um, like, well, like Edmonton Bar, you know, like a place like, like the Empress, like holds, held so much like love, so much like yeah, uh, history, so much everything. And it's just, like gone. And that's all about that land there too, you know, like it held so much for so many people for untold millennia and then like it's just covered up <laughs> yeah it's gone the strat yeah what I, what I thought of when you said yeah <laughs> all right well let's jump to these little rapid fire uh do you want to go yeah. for each one eliza and switch off uh sure i could start so what time of day do you write oh morning bathtub that's like the uh, like, bathtub big one yeah, in the bath, I wrote I wrote the entire uh, my next poetry book, Old Gods, twenty twenty three, Nightwood. Um, I wrote the entire thing in the bathtub over January and February last winter. What's your setup? What's your bathtub setup? I got one of those like wood things I bought from like some Home Depot or something that like goes across yeah. the bathtub, and I got like yeah. iPad up there, and I've had this iPad forever, and if it falls in, it falls in. Um, <laughs> nice. Think, yeah. A big cup of nice. coffee and just like yeah 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 i would do that for uh, reading if i get tired i just run a bath yeah keep yeah reading yeah keep me awake uh what's your do you have a daily writing goal so if you're doing that bathtub do you, how long do you stay in there oh i i, I usually try to hit two thousand words um that's a very ambitious uh that's good that's what um, i was gonna say <laughs> very ambitious that that was like my new man that was like last like honestly that was more of a pandemic writing goal when I went like in full, like, you know, lockdown pandemic when I wasn't like able to do anything. Um, now it's probably accurately more of a, around a thousand. So. That's not bad. I, that's my, it's usually a thousand, but then if I'm editing, it's usually two hours. Yeah. 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 Switches. Yeah. Do you, do you switch for poetry? Uh, yeah. Po I don't even count poetry in that poetry. I feel no. so spur of the moment. Like it's just like, yeah. Yeah, that's very much like a fiction writing thing. But I have so many, like, I'm sure we all do, um, like Google Drive or Word documents that are like, just like a page, like two pages, you know, that you've like never gone anywhere past those two pages of writing. But yeah, like that a first fiction or poetry. Words, three, but yeah. A fiction or a poetry? Uh, fiction. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a poetry graveyard. There's, there's, there's tons of different little half oh, yeah, yeah. thoughts. Yeah. yeah. So what does your writing space look like? Ooh, it's a, uh, yeah. Um, 
Um, yeah, basically the best. I, I write a lot actually just from <laughs> anywhere. I'm kind of like the person who can, uh, um, like I'll sit on the couch and I'll write, I'll lay down and write. I run an airplane, so I'm flying around, like mm-hmm. um, I'm driving around. I don't really have a, like, I'm not the kind of person who needs like a very dedicated like area or like Fair enough. that set up. I can kind of do it um, anywhere basically. But I, I, I honestly, ideally the bathtub, it's like the best like writing space. So yeah. The nice okay. thing with a bathtub is you're kind of locked into like, like nothing else. Totally. You know I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I would just worry about dropping it. Uh, when did you start taking writing seriously? Um, I've always wanted to be a writer. I thought I was taking it seriously in my undergrad. And then honestly, I didn't really write for like five or six years. And so probably around like 27, um, 28 was when I got really back into it. Yeah. I think you you got my exact age, 27. Yeah, Same. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So always, uh, always saying I was going to do it. Just never. Yeah. yeah really getting serious until it. 27. Yeah. yeah. What is the first poet or writer you remember getting really into? Um, it's funny. It's like, uh, probably Leonard Cohen, honestly, like my parents were always listening to like his music. And I remember being like, just blown away by the lyrics. And then I read the favorite game when I was like 16 or 15, they had a copy of it at home. And I was just like, this is so cool. And like, I, I really, 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 really liked that. But so probably that, like, uh, Cause I always like the, like the lyrical aspect to like, or oh, his poetry can basically be either poetry or songs, like, which I find so fun. Yeah. I like, I have a, a friend, James, you may probably even James and a, yep. No, no, not that person. No, no. I think he's been really good friends with Scott and uh, said, but uh, he's turned a lot of my poems into songs, which is sweet oh, to hear. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you outline stuff or do you just kind of do it like by the seat of your pants? I usually have a, like a, um, so my next novel that's coming out, Prairie Edge, uh, in a couple of years there, I very much outlined that. Like I had a whole like flow chart system. Here's what we're going to hit. Here's how it's going to work. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't like super detailed outline though. It was more like, Hey, these are like, it's more like idea sketching. It's like, I would like this to happen at some point during the story. And if it does cool, if not, it's all good. But like more of a, I guess not so much an outline, but more of a place like house ideas than anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I do. That's what I do. It's just usually like a paragraph per chapter, and and I'm allowed them to not hit those chapters if they if they don't feel yeah, like they're right. Yeah. Every time I just have to say, every time you guys like, oh, I know this person. You must know oh, this yeah. person. It reminds me of like <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, like uh, like when people do that. Like uh, sometimes some people say to me, oh, I know this one person who lives in the Greater Toronto area. Totally. You must yeah. know them too. And I'm like. Mm no no <laughs> yeah totally not. it always yeah. makes me laugh um when people do that and I love it like the, it kind of going back and forth between you oh guys. yeah 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 um what are you reading right now uh so I just finished Colson Whitehead's Harlem Shuffle awesome book can't recommend that highly enough and I was doing some stuff for work and I have a copy of um Miriam Taves new like fight club that I'm gonna read through uh I think it's fight club was it fight night something like that um but the new book there and then after that i'm going to read the strangers by Catherine vermette there that's my plan that's my reading point at least yeah uh Catherine vermette was one of our uh students osin's mentor oh cool yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i totally started searching the, every author and then i lost my yeah <laughs> where it was uh what's a book on writing you'd recommend um well, it was funny you mentioned that earlier, but like the George, the new George Saunders book. Oh yeah, um, yeah. where he Swing goes through all the uh, Russians. Uh, but it's it's get the audio book. The audio book yeah. is really cool because like he has um, people read these stories out like uh, like Nick Offerman and like other people like, um, and then they like talk about these stories afterwards. Like it gets so much more into it than the like actual like just like physical text. Yeah. So like, I would highly recommend the audio book for that one. Is it more like a podcast kind of thing set up where they kind actually of, like yeah, yeah. off book? It's very sectionalized where they like go through like one, like the, he'll have a guest read the, uh, the Russian short story writer, like Anton Chekhov's like work or something like that. And then, uh, and then he gets right into like why it works so well and the nuances and details and how you can do that in writing and like super cool book. Yeah. 
what was your favorite uh this is not a talk <laughs> these questions but what was your favorite church story from that collection um i like the uh yeah the uh i don't i forget what it was called but it was like the one where oh no no wait the nose that was like where that's my favorite goggles goggles and nose yeah yeah go where you just wake up and they just like don't have a nose and the nose is running around yeah. that like kind of like magical realism stuff is yeah. like, so fun yeah he sees a nose out in this like a jacket and clothing yeah <laughs> totally yeah <laughs> my i also really like the alyosha the pot oh yeah 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 uh good the next question Eliza. so if you could bring one piece of literature to a deserted island or uh, what would it be well that's a good question um I'm trying to think of like a book that I've like reread over and over and over again. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Cause I find that's shifted so much of my like life basically. Like uh, there's a point where I really love like Richard Van Camp's work. Still like it, but like, you know, I'm not like, I wouldn't say I'm bringing that to the Island. Same as like Richard Wagami, same like when I was a kid, like Hemingway, Steinbeck, like um, Lance Cohen. Uh, but now I'm really like, um, it would probably be poetry and it might be like uh yeah i'm just like um yeah that was a tough oh uh maybe jordan abel's like nishka like the new book i really like enjoyed going through that yeah and it's just kind of one of those ones you can kind of probably like pick it apart forever so you've asked a lot of people this question i've never thought what i would answer and then i was thinking i was like would it be cheating to do like a norton anthology of fiction yeah, you know, it would be. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's like, that's a cop-out answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's something about writing that's been on your your mind lately? Um, I'm trying to really, like, so I have another novel that will, my, yeah, Cody's working on selling right now, and I'm, um, so I'm really, like, going through that kind of process, because it was totally different when I, like, submitted, like, when submitting Avenue of Champions, I was like, please, anyone publish this kind of thing, where now, like, um people are like wanting to really publish this next book and we're like finding the right fit kind of and so it's just been kind of interesting navigating that like that aspect of the writing world mm -hmm. this is uh, the business part yeah yeah it's it's something that you you know i didn't never thought about in the first book and i just self-published it and put it out there never tried anything yeah and now it just seems like very daunting as I'm, you know, I got a second novel done and then the, the short story collection is coming up. Yeah. I'm just thinking of like, how do you now navigate this new world of like a business? Yeah, totally. I'm learning it all. I don't know it well at all. Like I was saying, I'll sign anything and people are like, no, don't. don't stop <laughs> that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, okay. Thanks for coming, Connor. Thanks for yeah, joining thank me. Along. It was great yeah. chatting and sorry for uh, the interruptions there. I had to, yeah. No worries. Stop and buy. It was really nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. And good seeing you, Ian. And, uh, Yep. Um, I'm sure we'll chat again soon. Mm -hmm.